Hello boys and girls, Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here to make you another cocktail. This week's cocktail is the Headless Horseman Cocktail. And it is the featured cocktail in today's episode. As is typical, we're going to start with a shaker with ice. To that, we're going to take some cream de cacao or cream de coco. Two ounces. Two ounces cream de cacao. I need more cream de cacao. I'll put that on my shopping list. Next, coffee liqueur. I'm using Kahlua. Two ounces. And vodka. One ounce. One ounce of vodka. And then we shake. Then we strain into a glass over ice. Next, we take a shot glass, boys and girls. We're going to pour some pumpkin beer into our shot glass. Then to layer some moonshine on top of the pumpkin beer. Try to layer it anyway. I don't know. See what happens. Place the shot on top of our glass and we try to light the moonshine. Yeah, it's burning, boys and girls. And there you have it, the Headless Horseman. Cheers. That's pretty good. All right. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. See ya. Have you ever watched a movie and thought it was so amazing, but then rewatched it years later and it didn't live up to the hype? Well, this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, Sleepy Hollow, is the exact opposite of that. Both Greg and I forgot how good this movie was and were thoroughly impressed on the rewatch. The movie is great but the casting is exceptional. Christopher Walken as a summoned demon. Chef's kiss. Cheers.
welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast, the podcast that combines the two very different yet highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. How are you, Greg? I'm okay. Aw. Considering I'm back in Ohio. (laughs) After my... Well, that's true. And hey, I didn't get eaten by a megalodon, Karen. That's good. That is good. (laughs) Way to go. I'm guessing you stayed out of the water. Yes, yes, Karen, I did. Got no reason to go in the water. Just saying. Because there's sharks and other things in there that just want to kill you. (laughs) Or sting you, even like jellyfish, whatever. So why do you go there? You go to look at the pretty water? What, exactly, what's the point? Karen. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't even sit in the sun because, we, you know, that's not good for your skin, Karen. Boys and no, girls. No, it's not. Sunscreen. My doctor did tell me before I left, you don't have to go over 35, but put sunscreen on 20 minutes before you go out. So there you go. No, so I don't have to slap on my 100 SPF no, with the 35. big hat. No, he says 35. I still go with 50. I, I tend to stick with 15, but whatever. But I'm delicate. You are, Karen. That's true. Like a flower. I, I forgot. So. <laughs> <laughs> you forget that all the time, Greg. All right, Karen. Enough foolishness. We're your SPF people. Yes. Every day. Cloudy yep. or not. Cancer is bad. Well, we just want to look not wrinkled, too. I mean, you want to look better than everybody else, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can... At reunions and things, Karen, I can always tell my classmates who went to the tanning beds when we were in high school. (laughs) Well, I was a lifeguard for a long time, so. Oh, I can't tell, Karen. You must have used lots of SPF. (laughs) Like baby oil. That's what we used. (laughs) Baby oil with iodine. Did you put sun in in your hair too, Karen, to make your dark hair golden? Orange? No, I did not. (laughs) You probably did, though. Did not. Natural. Sun bleaches my hair naturally. It's true. So before we get into the movie today, Greg, don't we have something really important to do? We do, Karen. We have to pick the winner of our contest. Yes, we've been running a contest. You've probably seen it on our social media. If you don't follow our social media, then you haven't seen it. It was a secret social media contest. (laughs) We did released a short episode announcing it as well if you subscribe to the podcast you should know about it well one episode yeah and if you didn't enter why not (laughs) it's such a fabulous prize you want to tell them what they missed out on well it's complicated karen because (laughs) it is complicated (laughs) originally it was going to be a physical copy of a film called the black demon about a big shark apparently And then the motion picture company, Paramount, decided not to release physical copies. So then it became a code to stream the movie. And they threw in a Fandango code for $15 toward the purchase of a movie theater ticket. So that's a better deal in some ways. It is. We haven't watched The Black Demon yet. When we put it on social media, it got quite the reaction. Not necessarily a positive one, but that doesn't mean (laughs) it's not going to be a fun watch. That's right. It might be so bad it's good. Who knows? That's what we're hoping. But we we? have put, well, yes, I am, aren't you? (laughs) I don't care at this point. (laughs) But we've put all our entries into a skull that Greg is now shaking. You can't see him, but he is. I am. And there's going to be three winners. 
three winners, and each winner is going to win a code to stream The Black Demon or on really Amazon. on Amazon or any film you like, actually. So you don't have to watch True. The Black Demon. It's not specific to The Demon. It's just an Amazon code. Code. And a $15 credit towards a movie theater ticket from Fandango. So you can actually go out, get your popcorn. Well, <laughs> it won't world. pay for your popcorn and your drink, but. No. And it's good towards one ticket. ticket. One yes. ticket. So if you buy a ticket that's $9, it's worth $9 to you. If you buy a yes. ticket that's $12, it's worth $12 to you. But they anyway, you it's, a free, it's a free movie ticket, basically. So you get to stream a movie for free and you get to watch a movie for free in the theaters. So exciting. I can't wait. Am I, I a winner? I couldn't enter. I don't think I don't think you're eligible, Karen. Oh, good. I, I don't think you're a winner, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. All right. Some first name, Karen. I'm just going to say Valentine Marin. Nice. Valentine. Congratulations. Our hey, I know winner. everybody's on the edge of their seat because they have two more chances. Two what more. is it? The next winner is Chase Ricks. Chase Ricks. That's, That's a, good a good one. name. Yeah. Yeah. And the final winner, Karen, Shakia Rue, S H A K E I A R I E U X. Say it with confidence. Yeah. Shakia. Congratulations, Shakia, Chase, and valentine so since you've emailed us we will be able to email you back the codes we will and then you can stream a movie on amazon and buy a movie ticket from fandango and thanks everyone for entering this was our most, most successful contest karen i would say we had the most <laughs> entries ever well this is a pretty it turned out to be a really good prize <laughs> it did but we've given away more true but we're givers, Greg. Cash dollars, yeah. Thanks for entering and follow us on social media and watch for all our contests. You never know when there'll be another one. Because as you said, we're givers. We're not just delightful, we're <laughs> givers. What movie are we doing this week, Greg? Is it my choice, Karen? It was your choice. Oh my gosh. The film I have chosen is the film Sleepy Hollow. Directed by Tim Burton from 1999, Karen. Is there a reason you chose this movie? There is, Karen. This episode comes out on August 23rd, and August 25th would be Tim Burton's birthday. Well, happy birthday, Tim Burton, who is how many years old? Karen, Tim Burton will be 65 years old in just a couple days. Go, Tim. Yeah. Retirement age, Karen. Finally made it. I hope he saved enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, isn't 67 retirement now? So anyway, yes. Sleepy Hollow from 1999. And what drink do you have to go with this movie? The drink I have found, Karen, is called the Headless Horseman Cocktail. Which is an awesome cocktail for fall. Yeah, do you see what I did there, Karen? Yeah, you, you that's big connection? leap. You want to say it again for those at home who might not have followed? The Headless Horseman. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to know how to make it, Karen? Of course. All right, so the ingredients we're going to need is pumpkin beer, which, hey, boys and girls, it's in the stores now. I can verify. Not in all the stores. <laughs> I can verify. <laughs> You're going to need some crema de cacao or crema de coco, which is what I used. Some coffee liqueur or Kahlua, as the kids call it. And some vodka. And the recipe calls for moonshine. But basically, you need a flammable liquor. So something that will catch on fire, Karen. Awesome. Did you do that? Did you make the YouTube video? I did, Karen. Did it catch on fire? It did for a second. Mm -hmm. Could you see it? <laughs> I could. Awesome. Don't know if the camera will be able to pick it up. but Because, you know, Greg does make every single one of our drinks on our YouTube channel. So go and check it out at Scary Spirits Podcast on YouTube and watch him make every single drink, even the ones that catch on fire. 
I like catching stuff on fire, Karen. <laughs> I think we've mentioned that before. So what but do you anyway, do with these ingredients? So we're going to add two ounces of the cream de cacao, two ounces of coffee liqueur, and one ounce of vodka to a cocktail shaker with ice and shake vigorously. Then we're going to strain over ice into a tall glass. Next, we're going to pour two ounces of pumpkin beer into a shot glass. And we're going to layer our flammable liquor over top of it. And then we're going to place the shot on top of the glass. And then we're going to light it on fire, Karen. And then we enjoy. Wait, how do you place it on top of the glass? You drop it in? It's it's tricky, Karen. That's why I used a tall, skinny glass <laughs> that my shot glass would sit on top of. You light, And then you light the shot on fire. Yep. And then do you pour it in? No, you, I guess you drink it. That's what I did. I drank the shot and I started drinking the cocktail. Well, it sounds like a showstopper. That's for sure. It is. Well, it's from um, Secret of the Booze YouTube channel. And they use a tall, skinny glass with ice, filled with ice. And they set a skull shot glass on top. Nice. And light it on fire. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a person, right? You got the head. There's the shot glass oh. and then the glass. The and body. then you take the head off. Yes. So it's the head. After, you, after you blow the fire out. Yes, please. <laughs> Don't lose your eyebrows over it. Fancy. But I, yeah. But I think it looked like they set it on top of the ice, maybe. Yeah. But my glass was very Did they have a long narrow. piece of ice? Just like a single square? No, they but they filled the glass with ice. Gotcha. But the mixture in there and then sat the top, the shot glass on top. Interesting. But it was a pretty big shot glass, so I don't know if they sat on top of the ice or on the rim. Mine, the glass I chose was small enough I could sit my sh shot glass on top of it because I have okay. a square shot glass. Oh, cool. All right. So it worked out pretty well. I was pleasantly surprised, Karen. Should we give our listeners time to make their own? They're going to need extra time for this yep, one. Because you're going to have Remember. to look for matches. Yes. <laughs> Keep your eyebrows. Blow that shit out. All right. Good luck, boys and girls. Hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. All right, Karen, might you have a brief synopsis for us? Well, I have two. Well, pick one. <laughs> no, we're going to do both. The first one I have is, set in 1799, Sleepy Hollow is based on Washington Irving's classic tale, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Faithful to the dreamy, custom-bound world that Irving paints in his story, the film mixes horror, fantasy, and romance, and features an extraordinary cast of characters that dabble in the supernatural. All right. Is your second one much shorter? Yes, it is. Because that's the one I have. Go on. Tell me a story. <laughs> Ichabod Crane goes to Sleepy Hollow to solve decapitations. Oh, mine's not that short. <laughs> but it's basically the same thing. What does it say? Ichabod Crane is sent to Sleepy Hollow to investigate the decapitations of three people. The culprit is legendary apparition, the Headless Horseman. Well, that gives everything away. <laughs> I kind of think you know that going in, though, Karen, don't you? Mm. If not, it don't take it long. All right, Karen, now we ready to get into it? Let's go. All right. I love pumpkin beer. Just let me say. I am drinking The Great Pumpkin by Elysian. 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 Imperial Pumpkin Ale, Karen. That means it's. It's the good stuff. It's imperial. It's good. Yeah. It's not just your regular old pumpkin. Maybe a little too much cinnamon, but no. whatever. All right. Sleepy Hollow from 19... Power through, Greg. Power through. High alcohol, too. That's what imperial means. That means it's lots of alcohol, boys and girls. Sleepy Hollow from 1999. Have you seen this film before, Karen? I have. I have as well. Did you see it in the theaters in 1999? Probably. I did. My wife and I were on a date. Went and see this movie. Did you watch this 
the second time or the third or the fourth. I don't know. How many times have you seen it, Karen? Um, Probably this is probably the second time I've seen yeah. pieces of it. Oh, you know, but I've never sat and watched the whole thing again. Me as well. Second time. Did you watch this on Amazon, Karen? I did. So the first thing I saw was rated R for violence, frightening scenes, alcohol use, foul language, and sexual content. Yep. All we needed was some nudity, Karen. Yeah, you'd think there might have been some in there, but there isn't. There was potential, but... Yeah, I think there were... Well, it's already an R. I know, that's what I mean. There was definitely... Might as well throw in some nudity. <laughs> but whatever. They weren't going for the PG-13. Maybe they were going for the PG-13, but couldn't get it. I don't know, but whatever. It's pretty violent for 13. So then we have credits. Then we see someone's writing the last will and testament. I guess the Von Garrett. Somebody Peter. named Von Garrett. Yeah, he Peter Von Garrett is signing his will. And he seals it with blood red wax. Yeah, there's lots of blood red wax dri dripping as we're watching this. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was blood at first. You but think it's, it's a, blood. No. But it's, it's a big not. wax seal. I always thought those things were so cool. They are the cool. wax seals. And then if it's broken, you know that they you opened know. it. You know, yeah. yeah you, you can't know. like steam that thing open. And we should go back to that, Karen. But that would add postage. Yes, it would. Because <laughs> it I weighs think it, more. <laughs> it would jam the postal machines. I would guess. That's true. Probably would. Next, we see uh, Von Garrett in a carriage, and I wrote, "That looks like Martin Landau." Got and some nice is. cameos in here. It is Martin Landau, but he is uncredited. I remember him from Space 1999, Karen, and other things. But that was the first thing, probably. Which is funny, because this film came out in 1999. But whatever. He's in a carriage, and we hear what sounds he's, like slashes he, of a blade. Well, he's air. anxious inside the carriage, you can tell. And there's a storm, of course. And there's a scary scarecrow in a field that he passes, and he gets little... He's gets startled and then he's like no it's okay it's okay and then all of a sudden it's not okay they hear they hear the horse whinnying is that he the right he hears it yes yes and a sword being unsheathed and that's not good so he gets out and takes a look and his carriage driver has been decapitated Karen his head gone yep and martin's sticking his head out the window <laughs> to look soon decapitated himself so he gone well he runs into the field well that's right he does he jumps out of the carriage to try to save himself he does then so that's when he sees a scarecrow with a well that's when he head. sees it the second time okay but he again is sort of startled and relieved same thing and then he gone as yep. you like to say he gone so wait two deaths before four minutes <laughs> i wasn't mad karen <laughs> I figured you'd be happy. No about boobs that. yet, though, but whatever. No, but you know, <laughs> deaths. Not quite as good as uh, my bloody Valentine, but whatever. Not everyone can be. <laughs> Moving on. Next, we see Johnny Depp, who we learn is Ichabod Crane, and he finds a body in the water, Karen, apparently in New York City. In 1799. New York City. He's fancy pants. He's all scientific and wants to, you know, investigate the body or whatever. He wants but, to autopsy it and figure out what the cause of death was. But he runs into a little bit of trouble. Yeah, they said, the cause of death when you find a body in the water is drowning. <laughs> Moving <laughs> yes. on. Let's go. But Ichabod is saying, well, what if he was dead before he hit the water? He wants to figure things out using yep. his... Silly old scientific methods. Then we cut to a trial, I guess, and we see uh, the Burgomaster, Karen, the Burgomaster, who is Christopher Lee, Sir Christopher Lee. Yes. And he has no time for Ichabod's foolish scientific ways either. <laughs> and he wants to send him to Sleepy Hollow to use his scientific ways to investigate three beheadings in a fortnight. Yeah, what's a fortnight? I think it's a month, isn't it? 
It's 14 days. It's Roughly. two weeks. Oh. And he says, this is a test to see if your ways work, your scientific ways. Basically, he's tired of listening to him. Ichabod's trying to say, we're just treating people horribly. We need to figure out if they actually committed these crimes. We're exacting confessions by torture. This is unfair. And Christopher Lee is like, every time you come in here, we have to listen to this. We have heard this from you before, Mr. Crane. Yes. So (laughs) let's make this easy on everyone and send you off to do an investigation with your silly scientific method. This shall be a test for you. In Sleepy Hollow. So Sleepy Hollow is in New York. It's a real place, as it I'm is. sure most people know. I believe it's in the Hudson Valley, isn't it, Karen? It was immortalized in Washington Irving's famous tale, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. The real Sleepy Hollow is now a modern village that is home to a diverse population of nearly 10,000 residents. It's located just 25 miles north of New York City. I thought it was further than that. That's pretty close, along the eastern shore of the Hudson River. The village of Sleepy Hollow offers a unique blend of natural beauty and urban amenities, along with world-renowned historic landmarks and modern attributes. Yes, in the Hudson Valley. It's got to be a beautiful place if it's in the Hudson Valley. I want to go see it. I've never been. But it's a cool place to go. Plus, if it's 25 minutes from 25 New York City. miles. Or 25 miles. Did I say minutes? 20 miles. Which so is, if it's 25 miles from New York, I bet there's a why, train. where I live to Cincinnati is about 20 miles. So Yeah. You could just go there, look around, go one day into the city. It'd be why, fun. Why would you want to go into the city? Because you could see a show, Greg. A show? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Then we have credits, if I didn't say so already. <laughs> Finishing the credits. And we see Ichabod. Traveling to Sleepy Hollow, I guess. And he arrives, as I wrote, a Halloween party is going on. What well, it looked like to me, Karen. He's kind of a delicate guy. You know, he seems a little squeamish. He fancy. seems He's fancy pants. Well, kind of anxious. <laughs> and actually, if you want to know how Irving wrote Ichabod is different than Johnny Depp. So when he described him, he described him as tall and exceedingly lank with narrow Mm -hmm. shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves and feet that might have served for shovels. His head was small and flat at the top, huge ears, large green glassy eyes and a large snipe nose. Yeah. So think of if you've seen it, the Disney cartoon. The Disney one is pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. He says, to see him striding along on a windy day with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. And he was a schoolmaster. Yes, that's what I was about to say. This has a lot of differences to this Washington Irvin story. right? Yeah, but I just thought, and there was also a a real Um, Ichabod Crane. Of course there was. Who was from Elizabethtown, New Jersey. Born in 1787, fewer than 50 miles from the location of the fictitious Sleepy Hollow story. And unlike Irving's gangly schoolmaster, Ichabod B. Crane was tough and seasoned military officer. He was a courageous man who most certainly would have drawn his saber and charged the ghostly horseman rather than cowardly flee it. So I don't know if it's ba- if that name if he just found the name and liked it or maybe Washington or if that had guy an just, issue with Ichabod Crane right. <laughs> or this guy <laughs> suffered immensely from that story. But either way, there was a real Ichabod Crane, and there can't be many of them. It's not like John Smith. Ichabod Crane's got to be pretty uncommon. So, but at the Halloween party, they're playing a game, and a young girl is blindfolded and. I guess she's supposed to kiss whoever she grabs, whatever people are surrounding her. So she grabs Ichabod as he walks in and kisses him. And who we learn is Brom Van Brunt is not happy. Yes, he's not happy. So apparently Katrina's his girl yes. or wants her to be. I can't Katrina. tell. Katrina. Yeah, yeah, it's the girl's name we learn. 
But they all ask who he is, and he introduces himself to them, and he's there to investigate the beheadings. Next, we see Ichabod, I guess, meeting with the kind of leaders of the town, right? The important men. Got the doctor, the reverend, the notary, which is a banker, and the magistrate. The magistrate. Is that like the policeman? Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. So that's, and the richest man in the village. He says he's a farmer, but he's really important because he's wealthy. And he begins questioning the men and he learns about what has happened, right? Not questioning them as if they're suspects, but you know, he might be. He's leaving that open. You can tell. He's kind of like in their face. He says, yes. Yeah, so he knows that there have been decapitations and the heads were found near the bodies, but they correct him and say, no, the heads were not found at all, which he seems rather shocked by. And then they admit that they were taken by the headless horseman. Back to hell, Karen. Yes. <laughs> and the men tell Ichabod the legend of the headless horseman. So they tell him all about it. And we have flashbacks of the Hessian who is played by Christopher Walken. Which I'm going to say is excellent casting. Even before he's dead, he looks menacing. Yeah, he didn't have any lines, though. True. Well, whatever. What a great gig. True. Just look, look like yourself and don't have any lines. But, He's very menacing. And they see, we see the reenactment as they're describing it. So we see the flashback to what happened. And the Hessian was killed and he was beheaded by his own sword, apparently. It's important that while we're this is happening, some soldiers shoot his horse. His horse goes down. He runs into the woods. He comes upon two small girls that almost look like twins. Twins. And he says, he holds his finger up to his mouth like, Shh, be quiet. But yeah, that's one his of only them, line. Shh. Yes. One of the girls snaps a twig so that all the soldiers will come. Purposely. Get him. Yes. One of the girls runs away. The other one stays, watches him get murdered. Well, killed and, and buried. So they cut off his head because that's what he did in battle. So when they're describing this horrible guy, he's he didn't do it for money. They said he did it because he loves carnage. So he would just go into battle on his huge horse and just decapitate anyone near him. So that's how they killed him. And then they stuck his own sword at the top of his grave. But Ichabod says the assassin is a man of flesh and blood and he will discover him. Next, we cut to a man I wrote hunting in a blind. It looked like. Oh, I thought it was a lookout tower to protect him same, from. Same diff. It's a blind. But they're looking for the horseman. Lots of froggy fog. And he ends up being chased by the horseman and decapitated. He gets a shot off, but don't stop the horseman. Right, Karen? That's true. Then we see Ichabod getting his horse. They're giving him a horse. The, the midwife's husband, I guess, is who it is, right? A little bit of comic relief. He ain't quite the horseman, Karen. <laughs> Not at that point, although later no. he seems to be just fine. And then they learn that the horseman is killed again. Someone comes in and tells them, and again, the head is missing. And this is the fourth victim. We cut to Ichabod investigating the scene. All the other men are there from the town, standing over the body. He's trying to be very scientific, Dr. Karen. He pulls out his fancy goggles and sees that the wound was cauterized in an instant. So it must have been a very hot blade. And the men but there aren't it, any blisters or anything. So it was. The men refer to it as the devil's fire. Yes. And then we're at the funeral. Well, wait, he does it. He does some weird things. So he has these strange goggles. He has all these tools that are his own inventions, he says. And then he's put some powder on the ground and put something else on it. And he says, hmm, chemical reaction. And then he makes a conclusion that makes absolutely no sense from that. But I don't know if we're supposed to believe that it was an actual thing he learned or if he was just showing off for the people there. I, I couldn't tell. But yeah, then we cut to the burial in town. And a boy is orphaned. Yes, his father was the one in the blind. Young Masbeth. We never learn his name. It's just Masbeth. 
So he's now an orphan. His mother died earlier and that was his father was now decapitated. And no one seems all that concerned. He looks like he's about what, 11? Something like that. 12. And everybody just walks away from the grave. And this kid stands there like, what's going to happen to the kid? Well, sorry, kid, you're on your own. Yep. I, I, I don't know, but. How they do things he, in the Hudson Valley, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Young Masbeth says, you know, let me be your assistant. Yeah. He offers his services to Ichabod. And at first he refuses, but, it, you know, he warms up to it. Well, he yeah. warms up to it once one who is it that tells him that there were actually five I was five just about victims. to ask you, is it the magistrate? I thought it was the doctor. Could Pretty sure it doctor. was the doctor because he's the one who knows. Yeah, but he probably so he, is the doctor. So he says there were actually five victims in four graves, and he hurries away. So then Ichabod decides, well, he's going to dig Thomas. Up, a, he's going to yeah. dig up all the bodies because he can't yeah. figure out what he means. So he exhumes the victims and examines the body of a widow. But that's when he says to the young Masbeth, you can be my assistant. I hope you're not queasy squeamish or, squeamish squeamish or something. Yeah. 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 Dig up the body, examine the body of the widow. Because they're all men except for her. Well, they dig them all up. but They do. Yeah. but And then Ichabod learns that the widow was pregnant, Karen. Then we see Ichabod. Being chased by the horsemen. First, he's going through this bridge, uh, covered bridge, mm -hmm. and the frogs start sounding like they're saying Ichabod. And it's kind of spooky in that. It, I thought that was kind of cool. It's Didn't kind notice. of funny, but not. But yeah, as he slows in the covered bridge, so his horse hooves are echoing. It's creepy. He's It's dark. The frogs start kind of saying his name, and then the horsemen appears holding a jack-o-lantern karen yes in his hand and he throws the jack-o-lantern at ichabod knocking him off his horse and the headless horseman rides off and we see it is brom van brunt and he was just tricking and ichabod can hear them laughing so he knows it was a trick yes he does then we have flashbacks karen ichabod's mother Dancing and singing in the cherry tree blossoms, in her, it looks like. In her finely fitted dress. Yes. <laughs> and he's a young child. We see him in it. Yes. Yeah, she dances and spins around and twirls, doing her best Stevie Nicks. <laughs> in her fine dress. And she's wow. drawing symbols in the sand in wow. front of the fire. Wow, his father watches. Cut. Ichabod happens upon Katrina. And apparently she's reading a romance novel, Karen. Well, neither one of them can sleep. And he comes down and sees her. And when she sees him entering the room, she puts a book away. She says it's a romance, but it was one of her mother's books. So it's probably a spell book. Maybe. But that's and... when she tells him that her father doesn't approve of the books and her mother died two years ago and that the nurse who cared for her mother is now married to her father. And we also learn that everyone in town is related in some way or another. Because when Which, Ichabod meets the the uh, leaders of the town, right? The, I, guess, I guess the reverend puts the Bible down and says, this is the only book you need to read. And Ichabod opens it and there's a family tree and the like the Von Garrets and the Von Tassels, where he is living now, they're all connected, right? So well, the he richest families that. are, yeah. All Bibles, I guess, used to have that kind of stuff mm -hmm. in the front. Well, yeah. Ours hmm. didn't. My grandparents did. I think my aunt has it now, but whatever. And Katrina offers Ichabod a book of spells and charms. She says it was her mother's. That's what, see, it was her mother. He reluctantly accepts it. At first he says no, but then she says, are you so certain of everything? And then he relents because if you're a true scientist, you can never be certain of everything because there's always more to learn. So he takes it. Keep it close to your heart. It will protect you from harm, she says. And then she wants to show him. She wants to show him. <laughs> 
they used to live in a small shack and her father worked very hard and, you know, became this big shot in the town, but she wants to take him back to where their old cottage was. So they go to the remains of the cottage and she draws in the ashes of the fireplace and just as like he, his mother did. Yes, yeah. as Ichabod watches, he's reminded of his mother. So apparently she was a witch too, Karen. Everyone's in live with Lucifer. No, they're white witches. But she does show him <laughs> the archer that's in the back of the fireplace. There's a, like a metal plate with an archer kind of carved in it, mm-hmm. would you say? Yeah, I don't know if it's metal, but oh, whatever. That'd be kind of hard. Will be pressed in it. Whatever it doesn't to, matter. I guess it would have to be metal, wouldn't it? It'd have to be. You would think. Yeah, it would have. Yeah. It was copper looking. Yeah, it was molded, so that makes more sense. So then Ichabod shows Katrina a little toy that his mother gave him, which we saw earlier, which is basically a round piece of wood, I guess, with a cardinal painted on one side and a cage painted on the other, with string on either side. And as you spin it, it looks like the cardinal is in the cage. And free and in the cage and free. And she they says, see. what magic is this? <laughs> they hear and see a cardinal chirping. And she says, Katrina says, oh, that's my favorite bird. I'd love to have a tame one, but I wouldn't have the heart to cage it. And then he's been playing with this toy for lack of a better word, that his mother gave him when he was young. He did it on the ride into Sleepy Hollow. Now he shows it to her. And she thinks it's magic, but he explains this just like a visual, you know. It's an optical illusion. Illusion. Basically, yeah. That our simple minds can't figure out. Ichabod's outside a room and the four men are in there arguing. Yes. Magistrate Phillips. Oh, and the magistrate packs up and leaves. He's like, I'm taking my ball and going home. That's right. Nicobod stops him and he asks the name of the father of the child. That's why I thought it was the doctor. Was carrying. No, yeah. it's the magistrate. And then before the magistrate can tell him, the horseman arrives and decapitates him. He gone. And the head rolls right into Nicobod's lap, more or less. Yes. <laughs> Then the horseman spears it with his sword and takes it away. And Ichabod is freaking out. Yeah, I wrote in shock. So we should say that, I mean, these heads roll. I mean, and they're pretty good looking heads when they come out. heads are going to roll. They look like (laughs) the people. And the way that they're, I mean, the sword cuts, it's, it's violent. I wouldn't say it's gory, but it's definitely violent. When it happens, cuts. yeah, but still, still shocking every time it happens, I think. And the whole mood of the movie is it's shot almost with a deep blue filter. It's dark, it's dank, it's, you know, ominous. The whole thing from start to finish is filmed that way. So it's not light and airy. No. <laughs> it's definitely dark and even the daytime scenes are are blue there's a filter for sure or something that adds to the mood and the music is the same it's very moody and dark and it's an extravaganza you're watching so we see ichabod in bed and he's apparently in shock i wrote he believes he saw the horseman so now he's he's a believer because seeing is believing karen you uh the is it the monkeys oh i I saw her face now i'm a believer yeah i'm a believer yeah and then he's freaking out he's like there was a head and and the horseman and the head (laughs) you know he's he's babbling then he i guess he falls asleep and he dreams again of his mother in her lovely blue dress (laughs) spinning around like stevie nixon levitating this time karen His father does not appear to be pleased, Karen. (laughs) Yes, he throws the Bible down and points at it. And he, I wrote, he puts her in an Iron Maiden. That's what it looked like. That's what it was. So next, Ichabod emerges from his room and he's asking for volunteers. He's over it now. He's ready to move on. He's dealt with it. But only young Masbeth volunteers. 
who will go with me to the Western woods? Because that's where the horseman is presumably buried and it's haunted. And he's like, okay, let's, let's do this. Who's with me. <laughs> and just the young, they all just look at him except for the young kid. But they ride into the woods looking for the grave of the horseman. They find what appears to be a cave, Karen, and they enter and they meet a witch. And the witch tells Ichabod that the Hessian is buried at the Tree of the Dead. Then Ichabod runs into Katrina. Apparently she came to help him. Yes, she saw that no one else would come, so she came. But wait, did you skip the whole thing about the witch? No, I said the witch tells him she's buried at the Tree of the Dead. (laughs) Okay. The witch is heavily veiled. We can't see who she is. She sends the young man outside. Then she kind of does a spell with bat's blood because she cuts the head off the bat and the blood goes onto the table. And it's almost like she becomes someone else. She handcuffs herself, chains herself to the wall because she lunges at him. And then she tells him, follow the Indian trail to where the sun dies and to the tree of the dead. So, yes, you summed it up. Yes, that's what she tells her. But it's a kind of a bigger production than that. Then he runs into Katrina. The kid asks, well, how will we recognize the Tree of the Dead? And Ichabod says, without any trouble, I fear. (laughs) (laughs) Then they run into Katrina. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, she looks pretty. She's a white dress on a white horse. She's using her white magic, apparently, Karen, to help them. But then young Masbeth takes them to the Tree of the Dead. He found it. They were just about to kiss when he interrupts them. Yes. They found it. Ichabod takes an axe to the tree and it bleeds, Karen. It bleeds. And he finds the severed heads uh, inside the tree, right? He keeps chopping away. I don't know why he's doing that, but he's kind of ripping off roots and limbs and Blood's flying everywhere, and then all the heads fall out. And he finds the ground above the tree has been disturbed, and he asks for a shovel. He digs it, and he finds a skeleton without a skull, Karen. He deduces that the horseman rises from the grave and takes heads until his own is restored to him. Just then, the horseman emerges from under the tree and rides off. Which was cool. I thought cool yeah, shot. Roots roots of the trees open up and yeah, and he emerges. flies out on his horse. Ichabod chases him. The horseman bust into the house of the midwife. Who's a happy little family. They show him being a nice little happy family. Well, yeah. The couple is flirty with each other. They have a young kid. They're obviously in love, Karen. They are. They have a little boy, but he kills the midwife's husband. The boy goes under the house and hides. Then he kills the midwife, and then he busts through the floor and takes the boy. So I'm assuming he gone, too. Yep. Kills the whole family. But Brom Van Brunt arrives, and he shoots the horseman. But the horseman rises. He and Brahms have a short battle. Well, Brahms gets a, gets a little cocky. He shoots him. Horseman goes down, and he goes walking over there like, yeah, I totally got him. Not, I mean, he doesn't reload or anything. And then well, the takes horseman like five minutes to reload. When I know. And then <laughs> the horseman just sits up like Dracula in his coffin or something, and it's he can't reload. So they, yeah, they start fighting with sickles and is that what they're called? Yes, axes and other whatever they can find. Bladed John, instruments. And Ichabod tries to help too. And Ichabod arrives and joins in the fight. Ichabod stabs the horseman in the back. With a sickle, is what it looked like. And then he and Brahms run away. And Ichabod tells him, he's not after you. You know, leave him alone. But Brahms like, I got this. He's very brave, actually, to do it. But Then they hear footprints on the covered bridge, Karen, but they don't see anyone. So apparently he's walking on the roof of the covered bridge, Karen. Yeah, the footsteps come closer and closer. And then he, it's pretty cool because they're looking through the bridge they can't see him and then he just drops right behind them drops behind them and he stabs ichabod and cuts brahm in two yes and ichabod passes out ichabod passes out a lot in this movie (laughs) 
Hello, boys and girls. You know, doing a podcast can be thirsty work. Lucky for you, we have all our drink recipes on our website, scaryspirits.com. And if you want to see how each drink is made, hit up our YouTube channel, Scary Spirits Podcast, and watch me play bartender. I show you how to make every themed drink. Now, back to the show. So the naked bot tells the other that the horseman is controlled by whoever took his head. Apparently he's figured that shit out, Karen. We have another flashback. Ichabod and his mother and an Iron Maiden. And apparently his father had lots of uh, torture devices in yes. the house. Yeah. <laughs> like a good, yeah. like any good Christian, Karen. <laughs> Behind the church altar, it looked like, was the torture well, room. Yeah, yeah any, any good Christian has got that stuff. But Ichabod punctures his hand on a torture device. It's like a... Both hands, I a think. A throne of spikes. Katrina notices them earlier, and he says he's had them as long as he he can remember. Yeah, But then he wakes up suddenly, and he sits up, and Katrina happens to be there, so he hugs her. And he tells her that his mother was murdered by his father. But he wants to know, how how are you after, you know, the loss of Brahm? (laughs) And she says, she's cried about him, but her heart is not broken. And I wrote, they make a love connection, Karen. Yes, she seems a little... <laughs> She'd already moved on, apparently. <laughs> surprised that she's not as devastated as she should be. But yes, from that has... first kiss at the Halloween party, <laughs> when she didn't yeah. even know who he was. Blindfolded, she knew. And just in case you're wondering, because I started to wonder what the age difference between them is, do you know? At the time, Johnny Depp and Christina Ricci. Yeah. Probably one... A ton. She was young, but she was of age, I would say. <laughs> Go on, tell me. Tell me how I'm a terrible person. Go on. No, 17 <laughs> years. Difference? Yeah, he's 17 years older than her. Wow. It's almost 20 years. So how old is she in this film? I didn't look that up. I just figured it. What they? I, I think she's about 19, I would guess, but I don't know. Yes. She was 19 and he was 36. Wow. He's pretty good looking 36. (laughs) Yeah. He did not go in the sun or he wore SPF 50 (laughs) all the time or Botox. So Ichabod then deduces that there must be a conspiracy in the town, Karen. He figures that the doctor, the reverend, the notary and the magistrate are all in on it. They all knew because the magistrate knew the widow was pregnant. They all know whatever secret it is that's binding them together. And he's making notes as he's writing, but they're very like one line notes, like just. Yes, they're thoughts. Like I do. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) When we're watching these movies. Yes. But when you put all of the lines together that he's writing down. Yes. Together, it points to Katrina's father. He says. Secret conspiracy points to Baltus is what he writes. But that's not what he thinks in his mind. He's no, just he's scribbling. On, he's just writing one word, but that's what the words are. Yes. Secret conspiracy points to Baltus. So then I wrote the Von Garretts, and Ichabod looks at the family tree in the Bible, and he sees that Baltus is related to the Von Garretts. Yes. Right? They're like brother or some shit. I don't know. Somehow they're related. So he realizes that if they're dead, what's his name? Baltr- Baltris? Baltris might stand to inherit the Von Garrett's estate. Yes. So he's the one who benefits from those deaths. Supposedly, yeah. So we see Ichabod questioning the notary, which is a banker, notary, who is played by Michael Goff. This is our third Michael Goff film, I think. And his office looks like a hoarder's house. (laughs) And he questions him about the last will and testament of Von Garrett. But young Nazbeth. Well, he says he leaves everything to his son. And his son, of course, got decapitated. So then it goes to the nearest living relative, which is Baltrus. Yes. So that's what he's trying to figure out. But then the kid sees his dad's satchel. Satchel. 
I was going to say briefcase, but that wasn't the right word. Satchel. And he pulls out the last will and testament. A new will and testament. Yes. The latest one. Yeah, he changed it to read that. Well, we learned that Von Garrett was secretly married to the widow and left everything to her. And her unborn and child. And her unborn child. So but the seal is broken. It is she, broken. So they knew. They had seen that will. But then Ichabod deduces that all the victims so far, except for Brahm, were either beneficiaries or witnesses to this new will. Yes. Because the young man, his father was a servant to the Von Garretts, and he was the witness who signed the documents. Yes. So that's why he had to go to Masbeth. Jonathan, yeah. And he figures out that Baltus would have inherited Von Garrett's estate as he was the closest relative. So he thinks he must be the one who was controlling the horsemen. So Ichabod returns and finds Katrina in his room, which usually would be a good thing, Karen, but... But not, not today. <laughs> but Katrina knows that Ichabod, or she thinks Ichabod suspects her father because she's seen what he was writing in his notes. And that's true. He does suspect the father now. Yes. He didn't when he wrote it, but he does now. Yes. He has papers with him and she asks him what it is. And he says it's evidence and he puts them in a desk drawer or whatever. And then she leaves. Which she, see, which she sees. She sees. Yeah. But she leaves as a spider crawls under Ichabod's bed. And apparently he's in, has acrophobia, Karen. Yes. <laughs> Extreme. Because he, he jumps, jumps up, up on a chair. Yeah. <laughs> and has, yeah, he wants yet young Masbeth to kill it but he moves the bed because the spider went under his bed and they find what appears to what well, what young Masbeth says is an evil eye it's a pentagram with an eye in the middle and drawn on with chalk under Ichabod's bed so then Ichabod and young Masbeth hear a noise and they go out to investigate and they follow a figure into the woods a female figure oh, which is like a cloaked figure to me but I could tell it was a woman. But they find Lady Van Tassel out there having relations with a man, I wrote Karen. In the forest. Yep. And she takes a knife and slits her own hand and rubs it on the back of the man. And at the time, I thought she was marking him. And I guess she was. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Somehow she was gaining control. Well, with lust, we find out later. But yeah. I thought... He was going to be the next one for the headless horse. Well, I thought he was being marked. But Ichabod doesn't say anything. He just slowly walks away. And Ichabod and Masbeth return to his room to find the evidence gone. And then he catches Katrina burning it at the old cottage. And he confronts Katrina and she curses the day that he ever arrived in Sleepy Hollow. He says, you don't know my father. He wouldn't do this. But then she's angry. So then he's back at the house and talking Katr to Lady Van Tassel, right? Yeah, because Katrina will not see him. No. And she clearly has a bandage on her hand. And she says, you haven't asked about my bandage, which would have been polite. <laughs> <laughs> because she knows... She knows, and she asked him to not tell her husband what he saw. She knows he saw them. And then the husband comes in, and she says in front of Ichabod, oh, I was just careless with the kitchen knife. And she's going to go pick some flowers to help it heal or something. Yeah, and Baltos tells Ichabod that the townspeople are meeting in the church, and they are going to give testimony against him, and that he should pretty le much leave. <laughs> You need to get out while you can. And we see Lady Van Tassel picking flowers and the horsemen arise behind her and Baltus watches in horror. But, but we don't see to it. the church. We don't see anything. Yeah. yeah. Cut the angry townsfolk meeting at the church. That's never good. Nope. Baltus arrives and tells them that the horseman is strike again. He killed Lady Van Tassel. The horseman arrives and they all run into the church. 
even Ichabod and the young man. Yeah, and apparently the horseman is appears to be unable to enter sacred ga- ground. I wrote. Yes, he tosses an axe in there, and it, and burns. it dissolves. <laughs> it burns. It dissolves. Yes, so he's stuck outside. Although there is one shot of him in the cemetery between the cemetery and the church. So I didn't know how that worked, but he can't come on church grounds. It looks like. So the men townsfolk shoot at the horsemen from inside the church, but we already know that ain't going to do no good. They keep trying though. Unless they shoot, I guess they could (laughs) shoot to the cap to cut him in half. I don't know. I don't know what would happen then, but whatever. But um, then the doctor tries to tell Baltus that he has been betrayed by his friends. But the reverend strikes him in the head with a cross, Karen. <laughs> yes, so he, the doctor's going to tell on the yeah. reverend for stooping his wife. I don't know what the right word is. No, the doctor's ready to come clean. He wants to tell yeah. Baltus what's been going on that he doesn't know about, but the Before reverend ain't having that, it. He's murdered with a big, fat wooden cross. As reverends do, Karen. Okay. And then Baltus shoots the reverend. They go. Yeah, so there's chaos in this church. All the townspeople are in there. People are screaming. Katrina is dropped to the floor, is drawing something with chalk. The horseman is <laughs> circling. There's one dead guy from the cross. Then Baltus shoots a guy. And then he's saying, everybody get away from me, get away from me. And he's backing up these stairs. He's got a gun. He doesn't want anyone to touch him because everyone thinks he's controlling the horsemen. Yeah. So they're all coming at him. And he tells them, though, that there is a conspiracy. And he's going up the stairs or the, of the church into an upper section where there's a window right behind him, Karen. <laughs> and we see the horseman outside taking a spike from a fence and tying a rope to it and he throws it through the window and puts skewers. it right through skewers. Yeah. Baltus and then pulls the rope and pulls him along. Pulls him out the window across the grounds so that just his head is sticking out of the and church grounds. And he decapitates him. Yep. He go. And Katrina faints because her father just died right in front of her. Gruesomely, yes. And we see a stick of purple chalk and purple on her fingers. And then we see the same drawing that was under Ichabod's bed on the floor of the church. Originally, they called it an evil eye, Karen. A pentagram with an eye in the middle. And other scribbles around it, symbols and such. So Ichabod believes that Katrina is controlling the horseman. She's laying on a bed. She looks like Snow White almost. And he says, it was an evil spirit that possessed you. And he hopes that she finds that it's over. He mentions, though, that he's not having the dreams anymore, briefly, which is why she drew that thing under his bed. While it was under his bed, he didn't have the dreams. He wasn't tormented anymore. He does give her, he says, for whatever reason, since loving you because, you know, that one kiss, he doesn't have those anymore. But he's he's over it. He thinks that she's definitely controlling the. Yeah, he's over it. He's leaving. So his coach arrives and he leaves. And he leaves the young kid behind. Yep. And then Katrina awakes. Who is mad. The young Mm -hmm. kid is mad that he thinks that she would do that because the young kid says she wouldn't do that. So Katrina awakes and watches him leave out the window. And as he leaves, he opens the book of spells that Katrina gave him and he sees that the insignia under his bed and on the floor of the church was a protection spell, Karen. Wasn't an evil eye at all. And he orders the coach to return. On his way out of town, he also saw a woman's body being loaded, headless body being loaded into the morgue, assuming it's the Lady Van Tassel, but he realizes something. He sees something that he doesn't like. So when he turns the coach around, he goes directly to the morgue. So he examines the body of Lady Van Tassel and he discovers that the cut on her hand was made post-mortem, as they say, Karen. Yes. (laughs) So he knows it's not Lady Van Tassel. So he's got two things now, that she wasn't drawing 
evil eye. She was actually protecting him. And that body is not who everyone thinks it is. Next, we cut to Lady Van Tassel, apparently alive and well. And she takes Katrina to a windmill and cuts her hair and begins reciting a spell, Karen. Do you know what spell she was reciting? No. Oh, okay. But she's trying to get the horsemen to avenge her one more time. One more night of beheading. Rise up with your sword. A head for a head. She's calling him to rise. But Katrina, when she's she's like, you have everything. What what more do you need? And Lady Van Tassel says, I don't have anything. You have everything. Everything in her husband's will goes to his daughter. So she needs now to get rid of the daughter to get the to get the money. Yeah, the horseman emerges from the tree and Lady Van Tassel reveals that she is the one controlling the horseman. She killed her servant and made it look like it was her by cutting the palm of her hand. Took her head and made it look like it was her. So everyone thinks she's dead. And then Lady Van Tassel reveals that she is an archer. It's her original name, Archer. And they were evicted from their cottage by their landlord in the town, but no one would take them in. Her mother was a witch and taught them the ways, apparently her and her sister. And we learned that she was one of the twins who witnessed the death of the Hessian in the beginning. She she confesses everything. She holds a grudge, first of all. Just like Batman. Yes, that's what I was just going to (laughs) say. Here's the evil plan. Here's what I'm going to do. And I was the blonde twin who broke the twig. And then I watched him die. (laughs) And then she pledged her soul to the devil if he would be her avenger. Her mother died within a year of them being kicked out. So they had to live in that cave by themselves, the two daughters. And And then she killed her. She killed her sister. She's like, everybody's gone. She offered her soul to Satan if he would raise the Hessian to avenge her against Von Garrett, who was their landlord. Yes. And all his descendants, apparently. But whatever. Well, she's after the money now. So we learn that Lady Van Tassel gets everything if Katrina dies, right? Yeah, and she says she had to kill the midwife because the midwife told her that she had a she knew a secret right in front of her husband, meaning the midwife's husband. So both of them had to go. I don't know why the kid had to go, but whatever. So she's loose explaining, ends, Karen. Loose ends. She's explaining why she killed everyone. And she says the horseman comes, and tonight he comes for you. And they're in a windmill for some reason, mm-hmm. a Frankenstein windmill, Yeah, it looks like. So then we see Katrina, Ichabod, and the young Masbeth, because apparently they've arrived by now, and they're barricading themselves inside the windmill as the horseman arrives. And they climb <laughs> up through the roof of the windmill to escape, and Ichabod throws a lantern down, igniting the windmill. The horseman is, nothing deters him. You know, he's already dead, so he, he just don't. goes through everything. <laughs> Like his sword is so sharp, it can cut through anything. He just marches like a demon on a mission, which is exactly what he is. So they jump on the sails of the windmill to escape. As it spins, they drop off. And then, you know, windmills being full of grain and whatnot. It explodes, Karen, as they run away. (laughs) Well, they watch it first. To see if he's in there. I was like, why are they standing there? Run, run. But he comes walking out. The horseman walks out of the windmill and gets on his horse. He chases Ichabod, Katrina, and Masbeth on their coach. Because they're in a coach now. Yes, they definitely. It's quite the chase scene. And the horseman jumps onto the coach. And Ichabod shoots him. And he falls, but. He's holding on to the back of the carriage. He is. And then. Ichabod is knocked off the coach by a branch and lands on the horseman's horse, which is following behind them. Then he sees that the horseman is being dragged by the coach and he jumps on him, forcing him off the coach. But he's quite the horseman now. He wasn't a horseman at the beginning, but all of a sudden he can ride this horse, headless horseman's horse with great finesse. So the horseman grabs onto his horse and jumps onto the coach where Ichabod is. And then he and Ichabod have a fight on top of the coach. Ichabod tells Katrina and Masbeth 
to jump from the coach. They do, and they land on the horses that are right driving the coach. Mm. Right off, kind of. And Ichabod falls off the coach and grabs the reins to the horses, which Katrina and Masbeth are on. So he's being dragged. Yeah. The horseman is on the coach and it crashes, sending him flying. And the coach lands on top of him. Yes. But that doesn't last long. No. Well, he already gone. Yeah. He, he So he just stands up. <laughs> yep. So then Lady Van Tassel arrives and shoots Ichabod. And she grabs Katrina and yells to the horseman to take her. Yeah. She's on a horse. She's holding Katrina by her hair, saying, here she is. Come and take her. Here she is. So Ichabod comes to and he notices a pouch held by Lady Van Tassel on her horse. And he runs and knocks her off the horse, throwing the pouch with the skull of the horseman out. Yes, so the skull rolls out. He and Lady Van Tassel struggle to grab the skull. And then, then Masbet hits Lady Van Tassel with a big branch. Knocking, knocking her out. It. Yep. So Ichabod grabs the skull and throws it to the horseman. Just as he is about to behead Katrina. The horseman places it on his head and it regenerates, basically. Yes, yeah, you see some muscle and some blood vessels and it all comes back alive. And then Filed Ichab- down teeth and everything. <laughs> Ichabod and Katrina embrace, and we see that Katrina's book of spells stopped the bullet that saved Ichabod. Ichabod. Yeah, because he had kept it over his heart like she told him to. (laughs) So then Christopher Walken, the headless horseman, now no longer headless, gets on his horse and rides away, stopping to grab Lady Van Tassel. And she regains consciousness and he bites her on the mouth and takes her into the tree of death. It's a kiss, but both of their mouths become very bloody. So I'm guessing he bit her (laughs) tongue off. And then Ichabod faints. Again. And we see Ichabod and Katrina in a coach and she kisses him, waking him up. They arrive in New York with young Masbeth carrying their luggage. Just in time for a new century, he says, Karen. It's snowing. She's rich now. I mean, she's got all the money. Credits. The end. All right, Karen. Anything you really enjoyed or were pleasantly surprised by in this film? Tell us everything you love. <laughs> I like the casting. I thought it was good. All of it was oh good. Oh, my God. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> I liked how it was filmed with the blue filter. I thought that really was different and eerie and set the mood. I liked the story, you know, calling to be avenged. And it's always good when uh, the old white guys get their comeuppance. <laughs> yeah, there. I liked pretty much all of it. Are you going to comment? It? Well, pretty much. Okay. There are a couple. Well, there's a a little bit that I'll talk about in a minute. But what did you like? You want to talk about the casting? Oh, I agree. The casting was fantastic. I don't know who the (laughs) casting director was, but that's who I would get if I was doing a movie. I don't think there was anyone that I thought was miscast. We have Johnny Depp, Christina Ricci, Michael Gambon played, you know, Dumbledore in the Harry Potter movies. Jeffrey Jones as the Reverend. There's been a lot of other Yeah, you recognize all things. of them. Christopher Lee is <laughs> the Burgomaster. Ian McDarmid as the Doctor, who is the Emperor in Star Wars. Come on. <laughs> well, Christopher Goff, Lee was in Star Wars too. I know. Michael Goff as the notary. You know, he's hard to recognize because he's good makeup as well. And then you have even Martin Landau, uncredited, Karen. Lots of big names. And this Christopher Walken, without a word of dialogue, except shh. (laughs) 
That's a hell of a cast. Even the ones you don't that aren't famous, you recognize, right? I mean, the his mother, Ichabod's mother, is Lisa Marie. But I just thought everybody was good, famous or not, very well acted. True. Makeup was good. Sets were great. Cinematography was wonderful. Story was good. Felt a little rush at the end, as yeah, the Batman confessional was. Lots of whodunits do. This is. Is this a horror film? Yes. Okay. Heads are cut off constantly. I know, but it's almost like a mystery action adventure thing to me. But I think it's kind of a horror thing with the headless horsemen and the okay decapitations everywhere. I can only think of one thing that I didn't like. I mean, you're right. It was rushed at the end and the Batman confessional thing. I'm not a big fan of, but overall the special effects I thought were good, but there were a couple times where he does, he likes this thing where the eyes kind of bug out like, like in Pee Wee Herman's large Marge or something, the truck driver, was that her name? Which, which, which I think is a Tim Burton film as well. <laughs> but it's just, it doesn't fit it. You've got this kind of serious film and then it has almost this cartoonish, I don't know how to describe it where the eyes pop out or something yes, and yeah. it just doesn't fit to me okay. and that's the only thing i could really come up with that i didn't like and you know oh, that's yeah, it did peewee's big adventure was his first film karen <laughs> did you see it peewee's big adventure yeah yeah and do you remember the truck driver yes and that happened with her the i yes, you know it, yes and it happened in beetlejuice yeah i just it didn't happen in batman I don't know if it happened in Edward Scissor's hands because I haven't seen it. I don't think so. It didn't happen in Batman Returns. It didn't happen in Ed Wood. No, but it's when they're regenerating. Yes, I know. Whatever. Mars attacks, it probably happened. (laughs) It's just not, I don't know. It's not, it looks like a cartoon in the middle of this very well done. Like in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, sure. Okay. And maybe Mars attacks. Okay. But in this. Beetlejuice. Yeah, same. It's pop up. Yeah, eyes yeah, pop it, out. Whatever, it's yeah. fine. It's that's the it just seemed out of place in this. But that's all I got. Yeah, I I noticed that and I didn't hate should... it, but it was out of place. Yeah, I it was I, like I, the only CGI thing that happened for the most part, right? The only obvious CGI thing. Well, there was some things with the tree had to be well, you know, but but this was, that's the only thing that I go. got. That's all I got. It was I'm the only cart. It was cartoony CGI. Like you mm-hmm. said, I agree. And I noticed it when it happened. I agree. We are Anything you uh, didn't like? No, not too much, except that it was a rushed a little bit. As I was watching it, I'm like, damn, this is good. <laughs> this is my new favorite Tim Burton film. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> It's just well done all around. But it can't, it's not, but it could be. <laughs> it's a good film. And I think it's one of those films you it's my forget. My third favorite Tim Burton film. <laughs> you forget how good it is. I know. I saw it in a the theater. I haven't seen it since 1999, Karen, when I was just a little Where boy. Where you think, oh, yeah, I saw that. You, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't leave the impression like, oh, my God, that was so good. But when you're sitting watching it, it's so good. It is. It's yeah. Good. But for some reason, it didn't stick in my head as being, you know, a movie that I would say. Well, oh, have you my seen God. other Tim Burton films after this? Do you see Corpse so, Bride? Do you see the animated ones? Yeah. So I think that's and Beetlejuice. Yeah. Right. I so saw I Edward think, Scissorhands. I've seen a I lot. Seen Ed that. Wood. I've seen. I, I, I haven't so I seen his I, recent ones. Yeah. So I think I, when I hear Tim Burton, I kind of think Nightmare Before Christmas. Corpse Bride, the animated stuff, right? And oh. I kind of forget about this. And I kind of forgot that he had Batman and Batman Returns either, too. But this is very good. Yeah, better than those, I think. The hell you say, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> One of the Batmans was good. The other, I don't know. I don't know. But this, Her, yeah, Karen, it's true. They're this different. is the third yes. best Tim Burton film <laughs> behind okay. Batman 
and Batman Returns. <laughs> okay. Well, Michelle Pfeiffer. True. That's all I gotta say, Jack Nicholson. Yeah, he he. I must be all thinking right, about it. He, he did a good job. I'm not <laughs> arguing with you, not at all. Anything else you were disappointed in? Or are we done with that? No, I I wasn't real. That's the only small yeah. detail I was disappointed in. Yeah, soundtrack is good as well. Danny Elfman did yeah. the soundtrack, so and there's lots of it if you pay Agreed. attention. Yeah. What kind of cocktail rating you want to give it, Karen? I think it's a two. I agree. If I if you had asked me before I rewatched it, I would have told you it was a three. I would have too. But <laughs> having watched it again, I'm impressed. I am too. I want to watch it again. I want to go to Sleepy Hollow now. <laughs> In the Hudson Valley. Yes. Karen. Yes. Would you like to hear some review from the Times, Karen? Yes. Let's hit the critics corner. What do you got? All right, I'm going to start with the New York Times from November 19th, 1999. Apparently this was released late in 1999. Yeah. Was, I think it was around Halloween. Halloween. Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It must be because both of my reviews are from November. New York Times. I will paraphrase. Is there fucking wordy? The year is 1799, and the millennium is almost upon us, according to the newly dashing Ichabod Crane, played by Johnny Depp in Tim Burton's enthusiastically bleak new movie. And speaking of dashing, when Ichabod gallops north from New York City, he rides up the west bank of the Hudson River, although the village of Sleepy Hollow is on the east. But an ornate visual fantasy of Burton's can be expected to make its own rules. And Sleepy Hollow does that with macabre, macabre gusto. So apparently, like, it's on the other side. I don't know, because this is from the New York Times, and they know that shit. So they're making a point to say, that's not but where they're Sleepy smarter Hollow than you. Yeah. yeah. His idea of a beautiful day may be someone else's nuclear winter but burton eagerly brings his visions of sugar plums to the screen so when it comes to appearances this dark shivery sleepy hollow managed to be as distinctively burton-esque as edward scissorhands or batman offering a serenely unrecognizable take on washington irving's story and its famously unlucky school teacher the film brings its huge reserves of creativity to bear upon matters like the severing of heads. Quaint Dutch bergs of the Hudson Valley could have bowled nine pins through Whit Van Winkle's sleep-in with the supply of decapitated heads sent flying here. Even if Burton handles such sequences with his own brand of wit. Shot one, sword approaches victim. Shot two, Blood splashes Ichabod's glasses. Shot three. Head rolls away. Shot four. Body pitches forward. Pause for laugh. Using a color palette more often associated with stories of gulag, Sleepy Hollow creates a landscape so daunting that even a large tree bleeds. At moments like the one revealing the tree's bloody secret in a couple of incidents involving witchcraft, Burton's film delivers a scare or two, but most of it is too tongue-in-cheek for that. As this film's Ichabod conducts a Holmesian murder investigation and even unearths a village conspiracy, he has much better luck with Katrina Van Tassel than any traditional Ichabod ever did. Katrina is played photogenically by Christina Ricci who gets through the film gamely while remaining very much a sardonic creature of her own time. An impressive cast shows off Colleen Atwood's sumptuous costumes and delivers dialogue, some apparently worked on by Tom Stoppard, sometimes graced with a clever edge. Miranda Richardson swishes dangerously through the proceedings as Katrina's obviously wicked stepmother, wasn't so obvious to me until the end. While the town's elders include Michael Goff, 
Michael Gambon, and Jeffrey Jones. The horror patriarch, Christopher Lee, is here as well, as ought to be. And Mark Pickering plays a teenage sidekick whom Ichabod cautions as he might the audience with, I hope you have a strong stomach. Among the many scenes of Cheeky Mayhem, one finds a little boy cowering beneath floorboards while the horseman harvests the heads of his parents, in case you were thinking of taking the children. (laughs) That's a good point. Next one I have is from Roger Ebert, Karen. Same date, November 19th, 1999. Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow begins with a story that would not have distinguished one of the lesser films from the Hammer Horror franchise and elevates it by sheer style and acting into something entertaining and sometimes rather elegant. It is one thing to see a frightened lawyer being taken for a ride in a carriage by a driver who has lost his head along the way. It is another to see the carriage bouncing down roads that have been modeled on paintings from a Hudson River school. It is the best-looking horror film since Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. It is not, however, titled Washington Irving's Sleepy Hollow, perhaps because the story has been altered out of all recognition of the Irving classic. Perhaps not. No power on earth could persuade me from rereading the original and find out. What it depends upon is Burton's gift for bizarre and eccentric special effects and a superb performance by Johnny Depp who discards everything we may ever have learned or thought about Ichabod Crane and starts from scratch. Depp plays Crane at the dawn of a new millennium, he says, confusing the rollover from 1799 to 1800 with the transition from the 1000s to the 2000s. It is time to discard the barbaric torture of the past, he believes, and bring the legal system up to date with improved methods of investigation and justice. He sees himself as a detective of the new order and a New York judge, impatient with his constant interruptions, banishes him to the upstate hamlet of Sleepy Hollow, where there has been an outbreak of decapitations. Let him practice forensics there. Johnny Depp is an actor able to disappear into characters, never more readily than in one of Burton's films. Together, they created Edward Scissor's hands and Ed Wood, and now here is Ichabod Crane, who has all posture and carefully learned mannerisms, attitude, and fastidiousness. It's as if the horseman gallops ahead in a traditional horror film and Depp and Burton gallop right behind him in a satire. There's a lot of gore. The movie deserves its R rating. And it's not mean gore, if you know what I mean. It's gore dictated by the sad fate of the Headless Horseman. The ending is perhaps too traditional. We know the requirements of the genre absolutely insist on struggle between Crane and the Horseman, followed by an explanation for his strange rides and harsh justice for those who deserve it. Burton at least does not linger over these episodes or exploit them. He's too much in love with his moody setup to ruin the fun with final overkill. The most astonishing thing for me about the movie wasn't the horseman anyway, but the fact that I actually found myself drawn into this old classics illustrated material, enthralled by a time and place so well evoked that the horseman almost seemed natural here. They liked it. They did. And I paraphrased. There was a lot more. (laughs) So they have good taste, Karen, just like us, apparently. Sometimes. Sometimes they do. All right. What'd you think of the cocktail, Karen? Well, you need to say what you thought of the cocktail. I can't try it until pumpkin beer shows up here. Karen, I don't know about you, but I thought the cocktail was delicious. (laughs) I can't wait to find out. Pumpkin beer and I mean, the root of the cocktail is Kahlua, creme de cacao, and vodka. So that's the root of it. I guess I could have just made that, really. There's a, there is a coffee hint to it. Coffee and cocoa, right? I enjoyed it. That's all that matters. It's almost evaporated. And I had a pumpkin beer to drink. 
as well. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I drank the shot first, then, you know, I opened the bottle, had to drink it. Couldn't let I it think go it's, to waste. I think it's the law. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, you know, break the law, Karen. Heavens, no. I'm a law abiding citizen, of course. So, cocktail was good. Anything we learned today, Karen? We learned about the real Ichabod Crane. We learned about the real Sleepy Hollow. We learned about Ichabod in the original story, what he looked like. That might be pretty much it. I was pretty enthralled with this one. Yeah. The executive producer was Francis Ford Coppola, I saw in the credits. That can't hurt. Tim Burton was born in 1958. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're stretching for things. I didn't really have a lot of background or things to. No, I got a Judas Priest reference in if anyone's paying attention. That's true. <laughs> Did you notice it, Karen? There's an Iron Maiden thing there, too. Well, yeah, I said Iron Maiden a couple times. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a big Judas Priest girl, so I probably didn't catch it. Unless it's breaking, unless it's breaking the law, breaking the law. I don't oh, really it was, know it. <laughs> it was, it was some heads are going to roll. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Good film, I think. Agreed. Next movie, I believe, is your choice, Karen. Unless you have anything to say about this one. No, I think we've pretty much said we like this one. Yeah, it's pretty good. What are we watching next week, Karen? We are watching the 1994 movie, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Any reason you chose that film for August 30th, Karen? That's Mary Shelley's birthday. It is. Yes, it is. So we're going to watch Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with Kenneth Branagh and Robert De Niro, I think. Is it Robert De Niro? Yes, it is. Yeah. I believe. Might you have a cocktail for us, Karen? I do. I found this on a library site on YouTube, and it's called the Drunkenstein. I'm intrigued. And you're going to need one ounce of Midori and one ounce of tequila. Mix those together and then add club soda to your taste. Sounds simple. Yep. <laughs> Gives you the green color. It's basically tequila and soda with a little green coloring in it. Green, a little green alcoholic coloring. True. Yes. <laughs> if the tequila wasn't enough. But I couldn't but find I, it. I, I guess it brings a sweetness to the Midori probably. Yeah. Will. Not a ton, but a little. All right. I look forward to that cocktail, Karen. You look forward to every cocktail. Oh, most of them. You still try it. You still, I you do. know. I'm a gamer here. I'm a... You're not a quitter. We're not quitters. We try I'm them. not a quitter. I'll try it. Try anything once. Things I like, I'll try them twice. <laughs> At least. <laughs> Anyone you need to thank this week, Karen? Well, I'd like to thank our listener. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Thank you for spending time with us. What about you, Greg? Who do you need to thank? I need to once again thank the band Verse 13 for providing all the music in the Scary Spirits podcast. The music definitely makes the podcast better. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks so much for listening. Want to keep in touch? Check out our website, scaryspirits.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scary Spirits Podcast. Find us on YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email us at info at scaryspirits.com. To help us grow the podcast, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You know, we really do appreciate your support. And as always, please drink responsibly. Music